the third of those elements, meditate on God's sincerity. What more powerful thought can keep us true to God than his faithfulness to us? When you can see that your heart is being warped into any uh, insincere practice, consider this. If anything of God is in you, it can unbend that hypocrisy and melt and mold you into the right image again. When his people sin, God asks what he has done to cause their unkind responses to him. Thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah 2, 5, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me? Just before Moses died, he indicted the guilty Israelite nation for their hypocrisy, murmuring, and rebellion against God. And to add greater weight to each charge, his introductory words showed the almighty heart of God, which they had rejected. Deuteronomy 32.3, I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Now, because this one consideration is such a dependable hedge against sin in the heart. Let me share some truths which furnish us strength to remain upright before God. A. God acts from sincerity and aims at sincerity. Love is the principle of God's actions, and the good of his people is his goal. He never swerves from these. The fire of love never goes out of his heart, nor their good out of his eye. Every time he frowns with his brow, chides with his lips, or strikes with his hand, even then his heart burns with love, and his thoughts meditate peace to his children. So will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set my eyes upon them for good. Jeremiah 24. This was one of the sharpest judgments God ever brought on his people, yet he designed mercy and projected good into the severest hours of it. When the Israelites cried out that Moses had brought them into the wilderness to kill them, they were more afraid than hurt. God had plans for their good, which they could not even imagine. He proposed to humble them so they could at last receive his goodness. God is so sincere that he gives his own glory as hostage for his children's security. His robes of righteousness are locked up in their salvation and prosperity. He will not, indeed cannot, present himself in all his magnificence and royalty until his intended thoughts of mercy become realities in the lives of his people. He is pleased to postpone the time of his appearing in all his glory to the world until he has fully accomplished their deliverance so both he and his people may come forth together in their glory on the same day. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Psalm 102, 16. The sun is always glorious, even on the most cloudy day, but this glory is not apparent until it has scattered the clouds which hide its light from the earth. God is glorious even when the world cannot see him, but the demonstration of his glory appears when the glories of his mercy, truth, and faithfulness break forth in his people's salvation. How ashamed we must feel when we fail to aim at God's glory, for he loves all his children so much that he carries his own glory and our happiness in the same boat. They are shipped together, so he cannot ever lose one and save the other. B. God's sincerity appears in the openness of his heart to them. A friend who is distant and reserved is not easy to understand and thus harder to trust. But the one who carries a window of crystal over his heart, through which his friend can clearly read each thought, is free from the least suspicion of unfaithfulness. This is how open-hearted God is toward his saints. 
The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, Psalm 25, 14. The Holy Spirit is the key which God has given to let us into his very heart and know what his thoughts toward us are and were before the foundation of the world. This Spirit is the one who knows the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2.10, and has published in Scripture the substance of those counsels of love which had passed among the Trinity for our salvation. And to ensure that our satisfaction will be complete, God has appointed this same Holy Spirit to abide in his saints. Every time Christ in heaven presents our desires to him, He interprets his mind from the word to us. And this word answers the heart of God as in water face answers to face. That's Proverbs 27, 19. In a transcendent way, God performs the same openness of heart to his people which close friends have with each other. If danger is coming toward them, he will not conceal it. David said that God's words warn his servants. And surely, God does send a messenger to sound the alarm to his saints, whether their danger has been caused by enemies or by personal sin. Hezekiah, for example, stood in danger of inward pride. And so God sent a temptation to let him know what was in his heart. He had fallen once, and God did not want him to fall again. It is God's way first to tell his people of his displeasure with them and then to correct them soundly for it. But he holds no ill will against them. Even when the father must lead his children into affliction, he loves them so much that he cannot leave them altogether in the dark concerning his love which will deliver them. To comfort them in prison, He opens his heart ahead of time to them, as we read of the Jewish church in Egypt and the gospel church under Antichrist. Before these sufferings came, God had already promised deliverance. While Jesus was on earth, he freely told his disciples about the troubles which would befall them, but he did not hold back the blessed conclusion. He would come back to them again. Why? to confirm the persuasion of his sincerity toward them. If it were not so, I would have told you, John 14, 2. And when God had to conceal truth from his children temporarily, it was because they were not able to bear it at that time. Now, Christian, does this glimpse into the faithfulness and plainness of God's heart make you want to be more open to him? He pours out his mind to you, So why do you still hide your secrets from him? The one who shares the most intimate fountains of his love and mercy expects a flow of trust from his people. C. God's sincerity appears in the unmovableness of his love. As there is no shadow of turning in God's being, so there is no turning away of his love for us. There is no vertical point. His love stands still. Like the sun in Gibeon, it does not go down or decline, but continues in its full strength. With everlasting kindness I will have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer, Isaiah 54, 8. The most flaming affections can quickly cool in the heart of man. His love is like fire in the hearth. It blazes, flickers, and and then goes out. But God's love is like fire in the sun. It never fails. In the creature, love is like the waters of a river, rising and falling again. In God, like the waters of the sea, which is always full and knows no ebb or flow. Nothing can destroy or change his love where he has sent it, and neither can it be corrupted or conquered. God's love cannot be corrupted. There have always been people presumptuous enough to bribe God to desert his people. Thus, when Balaam tried to win God over to Balak's side, he spared no cost. He built altar after altar and heaped sacrifice upon sacrifice, hoping to force a word from God's mouth against his people. Yet the father stayed true to his children and branded displeasure upon that nation for hiring Balaam and sending him on such a a foolish mission 
All the while, God continued to persuade them of his steadfast love. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Why should they remember that? Oh, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord, Micah 6, 5. This story is mentioned to remind us of God's faithfulness toward his chosen ones. If you want your love for God to be incorruptible, embalm it with the sweet spices of his sincere love for you, which is immortal and cannot see corruption. If you believe God is true to you, how can you ever be false to him again? It is cruel to return falseness for faithfulness in love. And God's love cannot be conquered. The anger and power of his people's enemies do not even begin to put God's omnipotency to the test. But truly, the sins of his people do that. You never hear him complaining about his enemy's strength, yet his children's sins and unkindnesses break his heart. They make him suffer in the choice of whether to love them or leave them whether to vote for their life or their death. Yet whatever such human expressions God chooses to use in Scripture to cause people to resent their unkindness and repent, he is never at a loss about what to do. Love moves his thoughts in favor of his covenant people, even when their attitudes and actions least deserve it. When the devil found Joshua's soiled garment, he thought he had enough evidence to present a dirty case against him before God, but Satan was wrong. For instead of provoking God to wrath, the report moved him to express compassion and to declare the coming of his beloved branch. That's all in Zechariah 3. Now, meditate on this, Christian. The love of God is so unconquerable that your very worst sins cannot break the knot of that covenant which ties you to him. You should try very hard then to have the image of your heavenly father's love more clearly stamped on the face of your love to him. Nothing can overcome his love to you, so you must not let anything prejudice your love to him. Speak to your soul this way. Let me cleave to God even when he hides his face from me, for he did not cast me off when I turned my back on him. I will testify to the greatness of his name while everyone else reproaches it. God has kept love burning in his heart to me all the time I was backsliding. Can I again grieve his gentle spirit and make him an accomplice to my sin by using his love as fuel for it?